Welcome to the Startup Grind. America. Okay. <laughs> okay. Jim, thank you very much for coming, and it's a great story, the last story about Bibo, right? Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, so I met Jim about two years ago in San Francisco in our annual event, Startup Grind, start grind annual event. Uh, we spoke a little bit, and after about five minutes, I understood that Jim was in Israel before, and he was actually in a kibbutz called Kfar Blue. Yeah. Nacho. <laughs> Nacho. <laughs> And since I was born in a kibbutz, it was very easy for me to, you know, to, to keep on going and speak about the kibbutz, about working with the cows and stuff. And, and then and from that moment, I told him, look, I'm going to come back next year and let's try to figure it out if you can come to Israel and, and meet some people here. Uh, so we met last February and we set this like six months ago. Yep. I mean, even before of that. And thank you very much for coming. Thank you for having me. This has been a delight. And the companies that I got to meet earlier... Uh, were really great. Uh, I mean, a, a few of them just weren't necessarily a good fit for Maven, but there were, like, I think, two or three that we're going to be following up with. Um, and, you know, spread the word. If you guys are doing consumer startups, uh, you could send us, you know, se send an email to Sarah at mavenventures.com. It's S-A-R-A at mavenventures.com, or you can tweet to us. We, we'll take a look at any executive summary and give you feedback on why it would be something we'd be interested in or not. Great. Thanks. Um, so like, like we do in Startup Grind, uh, we speak a, bit, a little bit about Jim, you know, uh, where did you grow and what did you do when you were a child. So we spoke before, I understood you, you grew up in Brooklyn, uh, New York, right? And um, what did your parents do when you, we, you, were, we, when you, you was uh, young? What was your father's job? And well, he, he was a doctor by training, but then started the first home healthcare company. So he really was an entrepreneur. And I think that was kind of infused in our family. And, uh, and then I mentioned to you that my brother and I were very big baseball car collectors. Does anyone know? Like, trading? Right, so you jump into oh, the baseball stuff, sorry. right? Sorry, no, sorry. no, not yet. Not yet. So, yeah, so yeah. Your, your father, he was a doctor, then he became like an entrepreneur. He had a good business. Yes. And you were like four kids, right? Yes, uh, that's correct. Yeah, like your first brother and uh, two sisters. And you that's right. One. I was number two. Your numbers. <laughs> So Jim has uh, uh, some new fact I wasn't aware about, the uh, number two. Number two, so what's the fact is? Well, it's interesting. Kaufman did a study about who the most successful entrepreneurs are. Um, and it's by gender and age and, and demographic. And, the, and, one, and it's really fascinating, actually. You could look it up on Google. But um, the one of the pieces that stuck out to me was uh, number two son was very likely to be a, a successful entrepreneur or like would want to pursue entrepreneurship. And they went through all these rationale about having to compete with number one, number, you know, the, the oldest kind of gets a lot given to them. The second has to kind of compete for it. Bio on the presentation? Sure, right. There you go. How many number two we have in the room? <laughs> uh, boy, oh, well, is that amazing? I, that, I've, never, <laughs> I've never done that before, but that's, that's interesting. There's quite a few. Yeah. Okay, good luck, guys. I, I'm number two also. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you were a very good um, um, in college, um, in, uh, in school, and then you, you were considering of like your dream job was going to be a doctor or businessman. What happened? I mean, where did you go? Well, this is where the baseball card story comes in. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, so we, uh, I, I was pre-med and I was working in the neuroscience uh, uh, department. Um, and what I realized is that science is amazing and it was very creative, but the process was taking too long and that wasn't a right fit for me. And so I didn't want to go to medical school. I wasn't sure what I wanted to do. So I opened up a baseball card shop with my brother because that was our childhood hobby. And it's not a, I don't know if it's big here, but collecting trading cards and memorabilia, sports memorabilia is a billion dollar business. It was at the time. It's probably still is maybe a little more. And so we, we moved, the family moved from New York to Las Vegas, and we opened up four 
card shops all over Las Vegas, one of them right on the strip, right next to the MGM Grand, and we became the largest baseball card dealer distributor in the world in three years. And that was amazing in for three years. For I won't me. bore you. Uh, so we started when I was 20, 21, and I finished at 24, uh, or 25, and um, it, it really showed me that I loved doing this, and that while it was incredibly hard work, and I always tell people, like, the best way to learn to be an entrepreneur is to sell something. When you have to sell something, especially in retail, which is so hard, you learn these skill sets that will last with you no matter what you end up doing in any kind of startup. Um, but then at the end of the day, after about four years, I, five years, I thought, you know, I don't want to be a baseball card dealer for the rest of my life. So I went back to law school, like a nice Jewish boy, you know, go to law school. And then fortunately, I ended up practicing in Palo Alto in 19, uh, right when 1995 when Netscape went public. And I thought the internet is going to change the world. So I went back and that's when I joined Snap. Ah, okay, great. But going back, back the years, at 1982, Jim was still in Israel. He was here when he was 14 to 15. What, was, what happened in Israel in 1982? 81. Yeah. Lebanon war, right. I was born also. <laughs> <laughs> you were born in Israel? Yes. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> and, um, and, then, and he was in Kfar Bloom. You, anyone knows where Kfar Bloom is? It's yeah, really in the north. beautiful. Right. Yeah. Um, Kayak, yeah. Kayak. Kayaking, yeah, that's what they know. That's right. And uh, so, I mean, this is a, a, a good Jewish boy from a very good family, and he's in Kfar Bloom and the Lebanon War, you know, and then the, the rockets and stuff, but he stays in the kibbutz. And you have a nice story from that time. Maybe you can share the story. With sure. You know, it, it really kind of, it was a Zionist program, and so there were 30 of us from America and Canada living on the kibbutz, studying Hebrew with our kibbutznik families. We had an adopted family. My, uh, my adopted father, Shlomo Razili, was a Sabra, he fought in all the wars, and there he was on the tank, and there were hundreds of tanks all over the kibbutz going up. I remember the lights going up into Lebanon at that night, and then we were told to go to the bomb shelter. And my parents still have the letter where I wrote them, this has been an incredibly moving experience. I'm so nervous for Shlomo and, and the families. We're in the bomb shelter. Everything's fine. Don't worry. <laughs> They're like, what is going on? Uh, and, and, you know, they didn't come and fly out and take us. And everything was actually quite safe. We, we were woken up by Katusha rockets. If you remember then, the, it was very easy for the PLO to throw bombs over. Um, yeah, but it was even easier, and so we were then thrown, you know, run back to the bomb shelter, and um, you asked earlier what job I had in the kibbutz. Everyone had a job, so I figured the best job would be to work in the bicycle shop. Why? Because I could put together my own bicycle. It'd be like having a car on the kibbutz, right? So I was the only one in the class that had my own bicycle, which was really kind of cool, and um, after the bomb stopped, we heard it was quiet. So my, my best friend, my roommate, Jonathan, and I, I was like, come on, let's go out to the fields and we'll go get a souvenir, we'll bring home. So we get on my bike, we go out to the fields and the head of the program, Pinchas, comes in accounting for everyone and we're missing. And he asks, where'd they go? They went to the field, he went to the fields. So they come running after us and we're there trying to dig out this bomb that didn't explode. <laughs> like, st is you know, we had no idea with these stupid American kids, you know. And they were like, get away from that. It could be a live bomb. And it turned out to be a live bomb. So we're very lucky. <laughs> very, uh, you have to get lucky in life. In yeah. life and in startups. Okay, um, but I did come home with a piece of shrapnel. Y you have one? I do. Oh, okay. yeah, I have one you have from the team. Iron Dome from the last war. I kept it also. And yeah, so. um, um, just uh, so moving forward again, uh, you had your baseball shop and it went really well. And then you, in 1995, you went into the business of startups, let's say, or high tech industry. In 95, I, I went to work for the law firm. I did that for about two years. It was actually really good training, but I didn't want to be a lawyer. And then I joined Snap in 97. And what did you do in Snap? Um, so I had an opportunity. This, this happens a lot, you know, if you do startup stuff. I had an opportunity to be the second lawyer at Yahoo pre-IPO, which would have been an incredible, lucrative um, offer, n you know, in hindsight. But I didn't really want to be a lawyer anymore. And then Snap called me. They were spin out of CNET and said, can you come here and run biz dev and strategy and market, all the things I wanted to do. 
and you could help manage the law firm. You don't have to do legal stuff. I said, that sounds great. Plus, Yahoo is about 700 people, and Snap was 20 of us. It was really a startup. So I went to join Snap, and we went to compete with Yahoo. We were a search engine. Actually, we're the, the, the number one search engine before Google was around, even, you know, in the world. And then NBC bought us, and we went public about two years later, and we were $6 billion IPO, $6 million company. It was crazy. Oh, it's crazy. Yeah. Okay, thanks. <laughs> um, now, we have like about 10 yes or no questions, so it's really quick questions I'm going to ask sure. you, and just shoot yes or no, and you can explain later. Um, so, <laughs> team or single entrepreneur? Team. Business plan, yes or no? No, but executive summary and deck. Okay, thanks. Crowdfunding. Yes or no? Yes. Which one? Well, I mean, there's a lot of great ones. You know, locally, our crowd, um, AngelList, you know, even Kickstarter, Indiegogo could be right for you guys. Okay. Huh. Um, Co-working space. Yes or no? It depends. <laughs> Usually no, but it but it can work. Why? I think it'd be very distracting. I mean, there's this notion of. You know, it's good to have people pushing you and stuff. And, and it depends, really depends on your team and, the, and who you guys are. But if you're easily distracted, you might not get a lot of work done in a, co in a fun co-working space. If you need that kind of motivation to like work hard and you see other people working hard, then it, I think it works. You just know who you guys are. How many people work in a co-working space here in Israel, here in this, in this room? Just raise yeah. your hands. Yeah, by the way, I actually think the other reason to do it is it could be very economic. It's not always, though. It's not always the best deal. But if it is for money reasons, that's also fine. But if you had a choice, then that's when you... Yeah. Okay. Um, exit fast or grow a big company? I mean, every one of the companies we invest in, we think can be a standalone billion-dollar IPO. So when you talk to Maven, it's always, you know, grow it, make it a successful business. With that said, there's opportunities where you'd be crazy not to really think hard about having a fast exit. So you have the founder dilemma of, uh, you know, meeting uh, like with a lot of money early in early stage. And in this, you know, in this, you have to decide if you want to sell, you know, and earn like some money. Or you, you or would like to grow, and you or Maven Venture or any other VC you would like to see him growing. Uh, how do you take care of this yeah. challenge? Well, that's a good question. So we're very upfront about the companies we want to invest in. If if you wanted to just do a quick flip, you know, we don't talk to us. Now, with that said, if the intention is we're all on the same page and we want to build a big company, and you know, Google comes knocking, and this has happened to two of my companies, yeah, and they've said, look. We want to buy essentially this team, this technology, and, and a little bit of your traction. And we didn't have a lot. A company called Katango was a spin out from the professor of um, computer science at Stanford, handpicked like seven amazing PhD and engineering students. We built a software company that built essentially Google Circles before Google, before Google um, the social networking play in Google Circles. And they came knocking on the door within six months and said, you know, we'd love to own this team and this company. It's not an aqua hire, it's, a, it's, an, it's an acquisition. And then we had to make this decision, like do, is, it a, is a 3x return in six months like the right call or should we just keep going for it? And ultimately, it comes down to the founders. And you know, and we, I'll never stand the way, if the founders, in this case, they were, you know, graduate students and this meant two to three million dollars for each of them, that's a lot of money for your first time doing a startup. And then they get to work at Google for two or three years with a great job and status. And the truth is, you know, once the founders make up the decision to go and sell the company, I'm fully supportive of it. And, and then I'll really help try to drive that price up or get them other opportunities and offers. Because, you know, you guys are the ones doing the business. I was on that side. It's not, I'm not doing, I'm not running the business. You are. And I can't keep you or convince you to do it. If you're, if you're mentally prepared to sell the company, then that's the right thing for the company. So I was in a very, very interesting uh, meeting just last week with uh, Professor Dan Ariely and some, uh, some interesting people from the Israeli industry, Comel Ventures and, uh, and Private Angel like Gigi. And we spoke about this issue. Mm -hmm. And one of the things they said is if you have a strong VC that can give you liquidity in early stages, it's, it can affect the founder uh, to sell or to grow. 
That's right. Do, do you you happen to you had cases before you get like uh, you gave liquidity for your uh, founders? Um, so it's interesting. I think I, I've thought a lot about this. Um, by the way, I just want uh, one of the reason why it's smart for VCs, especially micro VCs to be supportive of the founders is because over and over again, what I've seen, uh, and this happened with one of my companies, Social Gold, we sold to Google, maybe a little too early, two and a half years, it was a nice return, like 17x return, probably could have been bigger. But you know, I was very supportive and we, we had a great deal. They left after two years and started another company, which we were one of the lead investors in. So like, you know, things happen like that. They, and they remember, he came to me, would you like to invest early and stuff. Um, as far as founders getting liquidity, it's a delicate subject and, you know, I think at first I was completely against it. And now I'm, I would say there's a time and place for it. I don't think it's appropriate that, that founders cash out in a seed or series A round. I mean, you look what happened with Secret. I don't think anything was done illegal or wrong or whatever, but the founders of Secret raised, you know, at a $40 million valuation. They took a couple million bucks off the table and bought themselves McLarens or whatever, you know, expensive sports cars and stuff. And then, you know, the business tanked and failed. They returned some of the money back to the investors, but you know, they didn't return their money, <laughs> and they, nor should they. Legally, they didn't have to. That's a risky run, right? Like, I'm not saying that had they kept that money, it would have been a successful business. But, you know, when you have that sense of urgency in your gut, like, I don't know where I'm going to get my next paycheck. How am I going to pay my staff? I better keep working my ass off to get this thing successful. I think that's somewhat healthy, frankly, for early stage startups. And when they're sitting with, you know, I got two million bucks in the bank. I'm really working hard. But, I, you know, if it doesn't all work out, it's all not, right? Think about the reason they sold to Google was to make that kind of money, right? Now, with that said, if you've got a Series B or a Series C, like later, and you have it, you've been working for $50,000 a year, you know, like a, then it's appropriate. There's a time and place, right? Because you want to get them to a place where they're comfortable. They can now, maybe they buy a house. It's been four years. They haven't had anything, right? And buy a house. But most, that, you know, ha they should still have most of their stock by far. Yeah. Okay. Um, anyone want to ask a question about that founder dilemma, liquidity? Or, or the presentation I had? Or no, that's later. Oh, is it? Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, prototype user validation, yes or no? I mean, is it like product market fit? Yes. But so, so how you do that? Well, I, th I mean, I'm a big believer in the lean startup. I think there's, you know, ways to get not the best 100% product out there to test your hypothesis, right? Because you know, if you've mentally have a vision worth fighting for, right, and there's a, you think there's a big market opportunity then get something out there as quickly as possible, bootstrapped. But and isn't it wrong if your product sucks? Yeah, well, there's a, there's a big difference between a, a really terrible product and a lean product. And the difference is the lean product is not trying to solve everything. It's focused on the most important thing, and it doesn't have all of the features that I know all of you guys can build. That's the hardest thing is to say no. You know, yeah. Yeah, right. The, the focus on the main use case and don't get distracted by all the little features that might might take off and might make it, right? Just focus on that. And that could be a great product experience. In fact, usually, here's the irony, those are usually much better products than the ones that are overbuilt because it's all you think about is that little funnel and a beautifully designed product, small experience. Yeah, I would say take everything out until it breaks. And this, is, this is your first version. Yeah. And the more you do, the larger your margin of error will be. Yeah. Yeah, by the way, a, a lighter product will also work much faster, which would like customers even more. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, just, just another thing about prototyping. So I, I met two different um, ways of trying to validate the product. One is very interesting. It's a, it's a micro VC also here in Israel. What he's doing uh, before he's investing is actually going for like a marketing campaign. And try to see how many users try, you know, download the campaign or you know, go to the to the uh, to the page, you know, and trying to download the app. So this is one way for him to investigate how people react to this campaign, yeah. to the product. Uh, this is interesting, you know, and you don't have to invest anything in developing just on the marketing side. Another thing is uh, people just using, you know, Indiegogo or Kickstarter to validate the product. Yeah. 
Absolutely. I mean, there, there's great companies that were started by, uh, it's almost like a fake campaign. There, there was no, no product. Right? It was, you know, uh, they put out the value prop proposition. I can't remember exactly the, what it was. You know, there's many examples. What's that? Dropbox. Yeah, Dropbox. Right, exactly. Yeah, and there are many others. Yeah, like you watch the video and the like people click and they're like, oh, great. Okay, it worked. People really want this. You know, or it's, you know, 495. You want to validate if people would pay for it. And they click. It's a little bit of a frustrating experience because there's nothing there. But you, then the thing is, enter your email. We'll tell you when it's live. It'll be live any moment. We are oversubscribed. Oh, yeah, you. exactly. But it's just a validation point. That Sayo. Sayo. You know Sayo, the product, mm. consumer physics? It's an Israeli company. You uh -huh. know Sayo, anyone? SCIO, yeah. Oh, they also they went for a Kickstarter. That I think that was they raised a lot of money mm. and validated the product, and then they got invested. And yeah, uh, yeah. So the product is not what. Also, ah, how are you? <laughs> <laughs> also free. How many? How much money did you raise last week? Congratulations. <laughs> Okay. Um, China or the U.S.? <laughs> Both. Um, you know, look, the, the, the truth is we usually start with the U.S. still for our companies, but we, we don't ignore China. I mean, you can't ignore China. And, and it might be in the next five years you start in China. Uh, but I know how to build successful consumer startups for the U.S. market, and that's a different kind of skill set than it is for the China market. Okay, um, go to market globally or start locally? You know, it's, I, again, it goes back to focus. I'd start locally. iOS or Android? <coughs> it depends, but usually iOS. Yeah. First. <laughs> and then Android second. Uh, vanilla or chocolate? Vanilla. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, museum or rock concert? Rock concert. Yeah. <laughs> Anyone want to add another yes or no question? <laughs> okay, we're going forward to the company. So we heard about uh, Maven Ventures. Yeah. And you invest, uh, you invest kind of companies you invest in. But what would be like your five most important tips? I know you just spoke about ten. Yeah. But let's go to three. <laughs> yeah. Lean. So three tips for the people, the entrepreneurs here trying to build the consumer uh, app. You know, I, I clear like the first two are easy for me. The the vision worth fighting for, and it's all those filters. The team. I'm not sure which one's more important. I mean, I, to me, they're equally important. I'd say most investors would say team first, and maybe there's some truth to that because you know you're really smart people. You could pivot into something else. That's kind of your insurance policy. Um, but I don't like to bet on anything without the vision. Like, I don't want to just bet on a great team. I want I want both. And then I would say choose one or the other you know, seven on the list, um, maybe focus would be there. Because if you have those three, you know, you can get the right start. But I don't want to exclude culture and values and product market fit and all that, but I'd say like those, maybe those three. What is the most important tip for you for don't do? For people coming to meet you, coming to meet Sarah or other uh, VCs, don't do? Well, I mean, in general, I would say know your VCs or angel investors. And don't waste their time or your time. Like if you came pitching to me, a B two B or enterprise company, I'm just not going to. I'm not going to invest. In fact, I, I probably couldn't even be very helpful there because I don't know that business. Just you know. So I'd say that's that's one thing. Like know that we do direct to consumer and what that is. Look at our portfolio. Look at the kind of companies that we've worked with. We won't change it. That's that's our strategy. We have investors in Maven that we've promised this is what we're going to do. This is the same thing with a lot of VCs. Yeah. That's a good question. So actually, Zoom, like Banjo, was I helped them start a direct-to-consumer video calling app. It was essentially competing with Google Hangouts before Google Hangouts. Google Hangouts just launched, and we had a better vision. What happened there was um, the founders were the director of engineering from WebEx. He's a good personal friend of mine. Oh, he's awesome. Yeah. yeah and, and so his, his natural DNA was enterprise. So as much as he, he wanted to do consumer, we co-invested in Tango. He's an investor in Tango. He wanted to do consumer. I was like, great, I'll help you do it. I came up with the name of the company, the marketing strategy, and it was working. But what was happening is so many companies were coming to him and saying, if you just built these three features, we pay you like $100 a month. you know. 
And he called me one day and he said, I hope you don't mind. We're going to switch to enterprise. We just have such an option. I was like, I don't mind at all. It's great. you know. So what was great about it is after a year and a half, we built a beautifully designed product for you know, grandma to use. So it's by far the most simple, high quality, least expensive product for enterprise. It was actually very lucky that we started on the consumer and we kind of, it's the consumerization of enterprise. The reason they pivoted is because the market opportunity for them is so powerful and that's their comfort zone. And they just raised, a, I don't know if you know, they raised a big Series C from Emergence Capital and they're off to the races and they're just printing money. Um, so we, we were sitting today, we had some meeting today with like eight startups. And uh, one thing that I caught during the day, I mean I caught many, but one of the things is there is some difference between men and women. It's something that you, you said today. Maybe we can share it with the people here. As far as the ambient network, uh, are the ones that, like, who's around you? Right. Yeah, no, actually, but in general, when you're doing consumer apps, you know, there, there are, there will, can be differences when you're targeting a primarily female demographic or a male demographic. Um, and know how your app and your product will impact different demographics. So obviously, like Pinterest, really took off with the female demographic. It was like more beautifully designed and it, w it just spoke to women much more than men. One, the example you're bringing up is um, Banjo. And do you guys remember like Highlight and Sonar and Glancy all, I think that was like three years ago, they were the big South by Southwest companies. It would tell you who's around you, right? If you just had the app and you turned it on, you would know anyone, how you're connected to anyone in this room. Like in theory, it's kind of a cool idea. You're walking in the street, you're having lunch. If everyone had the same app, everyone know everything about everyone, how you're connected. The problem was it's still kind of creepy, especially for women. So like women would never turn it on. And so then it became more of like a men's networking app thing used for like conferences. And the narrow use case really killed it. So we're not, re like I say, that we're not ready for prime time. I, th I still think it's a great idea. And it'll be something that we'll do like in web 4.0. You know, it'll, it'll take off at some point when we're all comfortable knowing that our presence is always on. But we're not there yet. There is an anonymous feature over there at that app, by the way. What's that? There is an anonymous feature. By the way, an anonymity could, take, could actually, you know, be the answer to that. And, and, and this doesn't apply to your anonymous network, but in general, um, we're not big fans of anonymous networks uh, like Secret and Yik Yak and others. Um, anonymous networks can work for different kind of products, but for social products primarily, they generally don't work. Uh, what they'll do, they'll work, they'll get really massive scale, and then either it becomes very negative because people can hide behind their anonymity, um, or it just starts petering out because you didn't really build a lasting business. So uh, previously you said the most important thing for a good startup is a team, uh, maybe one of the two. and. Uh, early uh, events we had with other VCs, the, the, uh, everybody speak about the team. But this is a, it's problematic to, to, to find the, the great team, you know, the first 10 people to work in your company, not just the founders. Mm -hmm. So what's the magic of bringing good talents? <laughs> well, I, I think that it's the reason why we spend so much time on the founding team, because if you have a great founding team, then that will attract other great second third, fourth employees, right? And it just goes from there. So you have this amazing, brilliant leader of technology who other great leading, brilliant technology uh, you know, executives want to work for. And then it spins out from there. And if you start with a lesser team, then it's going to be much more challenging. So it does really start at the founding team. Okay. Any more questions for Jim? David? Anyone? It depends on what your strategy is. Um, you, here, here's the thing is, not every consumer company should raise money from me or a venture investor, right? Because if you can raise a little bit of money from an angel investor or friends and family and bootstrap it and build a profitable business, that's, that's like most successful companies in the world, yep. right? And there's nothing wrong with that. I think we, we've turned this a little bit too much, to too much pressure for unicorn, unicorn. There's a lot of very wealthy people who never raised money and went public or sold it. They just built a nice business. Like, you know, like the baseball card shop. It was a very lucrative business. We were making a lot of money. 
We're never going to raise money. And, you know, and so the, the, maybe the answer is no for you. Now, if you want to raise you know, US VC money in particular, or even I think some of the more sophisticated venture money here, there's an expectation that you're going to have to find a bigger market, right? And so whether you go to you know, London and Europe first, or maybe China first, or the US first can be dependent on your, on your business. What's your business? And wh why does it need to exist? There's a lot of e-commerce uh, companies out there. Because of everything we talked about just earlier about gamification, well, we didn't use the term gamification, but everything to do with New Royale and all that, mm -hmm. getting people to be interested in products and discover them, and uh, that's very strong in the US. That's where the market is. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, there's examples, like Waze got popular here. They proved out the model. They, they worked out the kinks. And it was just a natural. Of course, it's going to work all around the world. It's going to work in the U.S., right? So maybe you take the time and figure it out here. Um, you know, I don't know if you can apply. We're, we don't invest a lot in e-commerce, to be honest. So that's not an area of expertise. Um, primarily because for e most e-commerce companies, it's hard to figure out the virality. You're going to end up having to spend money to acquire customers. But maybe that's okay because you can make money on them right away. That's, yeah, you, you've got your CAC, your customer acquisition cost, your LTV, your long-term value. Those are very hard businesses to scale. And most of them will fail because you reach a point where you've used up all your customer acquisition channels. All of a sudden, your CAC is higher than your LTV. And overnight, you're like on the other side. And you see a lot of these companies that have exploded like fab. And all of a sudden, where'd they go? Boom. You know? Diminishing yeah, there's diminishing returns. So, I, I, but you know what? Find people who are experts in that business who can really help you make that call. One more. Norm? Okay, short question with the long one. <laughs> Go for the short and the long one. So, uh, yeah, okay. Okay, so the long one is yeah. I'm a single founder of a, of a, of a company. Uh, and it's quite well developed. There's a vision, there's a patent, there's an MVP going on right now. And the question is the first partner, I have a candidate, he's a hot shot, the Air Force pilot. Right. But, but I'm not a manager. I can't be a CEO. I'm not a business guy. And what's your role? Vision, the product, the crazy professor. Right. Okay. So jack of all trades, but definitely not an organized uh, manager. Uh, well, okay. So let's uh, uh, we'll talk about your specific example. But in general, you know, your co-founder relationship is like a marriage, right? In fact, you may be spending more time with your co-founder than you would with a spouse or best friend, right? So I would, whatever you do, I would do it thoughtfully and not too quickly. And it might be that you spend time with them, you know, like months. Maybe you, you do this for three months as a test case to see how you work together, right? To say, like, to start with, it'll be this kind of relationship contractor. But if it works out, the idea is you'd be the CEO of this company. And I think then the other thing is, like, this is... This is always hard when it's your vision and it's your product, but you don't want to be the CEO. To bring in a technical person to be the CEO, it can work, but it's not their vision. It's not their passion, right? And so I would encourage you to really dig deep and think, why not be the CEO? Like, why let someone else run your vision and find a partner who could be your CTO? Like, what? maybe there's a role for him to be your business partner and marketing person and, and to head of tech, whatever. But, like, usually, if the founder visionary doesn't want to be the CEO and brings in a co-founder, it doesn't work. doesn't mean it can't, but there's always a red flag there for me when I look at it as from an investor. Does that make sense? Okay. What? For example, Google. They, they brought in a different CEO. That's a di very different s situation. So what you're talking about is the two founders were co-founders, both you know visionaries. They were almost like two co-CEO founders in a way, and they were running the company great. And then after many years, you know, they brought on a professional CEO, and that can work. That can work. They they were scaling this thing. It was getting crazy. Yeah. yeah. And by the way, interestingly, it's turned now. Where Larry's back as the CEO and Eric's. Oh. B2C um, startups have a 
great idea. They, they solve, in their eyes, a real issue with, you know, with, their, with their customers, but they fail to find a, you know, a, a real business model. Mm -hmm. And they can, sometimes they come up with something, you know, really uh, artificial, you know, just pushing the business model so they have some kind of business model. Mm -hmm. What do you think of it? Because, you know, they yeah. have a great idea, but they, they still don't know how to make money, but still, you want them to have some kind of an idea how to make money. Right. Yeah, so, you know, we t I talked about this. Every one of the companies that we invest in that have hyper growth potential, you know, from zero to hundreds of millions of customers that are not making money, all have a vision of what the revenue model could be. So I would encourage all the companies who are trying to achieve hyper growth to know at least what one or two paths of revenue would be. And it could be simply, you know, once we have 50 million teenage girls between 13 and 19 on this social pr platform, we're going to make money on advertising. We're not just going to put up banner ads. It's going to be integrated it's and stuff. Naive to say, well, um, well, we have 100 million users. And we'll I, you know what? I'm not so sure. I'm, I'm not so sure it's naive because, you know, look at Instagram. Instagram sold for a billion dollars to Facebook. They had zero revenue, and everyone said that was the dumbest deal they've ever done. That was this unbelievably stupid. It may be going down as the best deal in tech history, right, it's, I think, down the road. And the reason is because, first of all, today, they're making a lot of money on advertising revenue. It's not crazy to think that if you have a highly engaged audience that are spending an enormous amount of time on your product, that you will get advertising dollars, right? And especially if you could do it in a creative way that, that you know, helps get the brand in front of this consumer base and, and makes money, right? Um, and the other thing is, interestingly, it's probably would have sold today for like four or five billion. <laughs> You know, uh, maybe more. I mean, it's it's such a fast part, uh, growing part of their business. I mean, WhatsApp, same kind of thing. You know, people that was a very expensive deal, but still, my you look back and go, there may be more people on WhatsApp than Facebook in the next two or three years. I mean, say that was a genius move. Imagine how, if WhatsApp was a competitor to Facebook and they had more people. Uh, yeah. Last question, Barack. Mm -hmm. When was the time that you think that you uh, will recognize that uh, it's beyond feature? Because many people in the early days of Snapchat saw that it's like... Yeah. So I saw them, in hindsight, pretty early. Um, there were two challenges for me. I saw them too late for my angel investment business, and I hadn't yet done investing out of Maven Ventures Fund. By the time I saw them for Maven Ventures Fund, it was about a billion, like 800 million, which would have been a great investment. But I, I, I just couldn't do, like it was beyond the realm of our, what we told our LPs, uh, our, our investors we would do. But I still thought it was a great investment. And I actually tried to meet them and invest, if I could, personally or through Maven, right? So I, here's the deal. Those numbers were staggering. The kind of engagement that we were seeing, and once I understood, like it didn't speak to me. I don't use Snapchat that much. I'm, I was especially not the early demographic, but that's okay. But once I saw the numbers, and I was like, "What are people doing?" Oh, I get it. They're tired of text messages lasting forever. It's obvious. And look what a fun way to communicate with photos that disappear. That's genius. And then everyone was getting confused with all the sexting going on. That was just PR. Right, it was great PR, by the way. They never stopped talking about it because it kept generating business. All these people going on, all oh, this sexting. Oh, it's not. It's just a, way, a fun way to communicate with people. Oh, hey, I love this thing, right? I, I can't tell you that, I mean, there were still a lot of people using it, you know, millions, but it was, it was the engagement numbers. Like, you know, I don't want 70% coming back 10, 15 times a day, but more. You know, I don't know, whatever number, like the, the numbers are now out there publicly. I'm, but th you knew. You know what, uh, you never know, and I wish I had met them, because I could tell you, I, you know, I'm an investor or I blew it. I didn't meet them until they had left Stanford and went down to LA, and then it was too late. And, but Snapchat has been the fastest to, to hypergrowth as far as also their valuation. So, you know, like even then, if normally it would have been in, the, you know, the tens of millions of valuation, I would have definitely invested, right? Uh, had I been uh, had the opportunity to, right? Um, there are definitely companies I see the vision and I go, 
I don't get it, and I'm not going to get invested. I'll tell you one, Airbnb. There were a lot of us who saw it early. I passed. Because I, I thought about for myself, I wouldn't want any stranger staying in my house, you know. And that's a mistake, you know, as investors, we have to think about other outside of our demographic. But I thought that I was a demographic, so I was like, yeah, and I get it, you know. I also knew that was going to be a hard business to build, and it was. But they did it, and that was an amazing company. Um, you know, so I, I don't, I'm not going to be right all the time. But I think for social communication platforms, I'm right more than I'm not. And I generally can sense. I saw Facebook. I was the couple thousand people were using it. And I thought, this is a really interesting product. You know, it's not dating. It's like, it's like I don't know what you call it. We didn't call it social. Network. We didn't call it. And I did something. I, I noticed the people who were using it, the first couple thousand people using it, were much younger than me. And so I had this woman that was working with me at the time. I gave her my access pass, and she went on the weekend. And I said, why don't you check it out? I was like, I think it's amazing, but I'm not sure what's going on. So she came back on Monday, and I was like, what do you, what do you think? She goes, it changed my life. I'm like, what? <laughs> what happened? She goes, I met a long-lost friend I hadn't seen in years. You know? I mean, she was like 24, 25 years, like 10 years. You know? But that changed her life, to reconnect with someone. It was very powerful. And, he, and, and I was like, that's it? She goes, no, that was amazing, but even more. I got a date next Friday. I'm like, okay, this is, we're on to something here. Well, it was a, it, it, all the social networking apps early on were pretend dating apps. It was a safe way for women to meet people because you weren't there to date. You were there to meet people. And you did dating naturally through friends. It became a lot more than that, obviously, with Facebook. But th yeah, that's what drove a lot of the initial traction. Okay, so like um, always, Avi, this is the last question from the crowd, Avi Wise, our reporter. So, I mean, let me answer that with a couple of uh, ways. Number one, I would say absolutely that's not the case. I think Silicon Valley is still by far, by far, the market leader in high tech innovation and startups. Now, you, you have to understand, I filter this through my lens, which is consumer startups. Okay? The best place to build a consumer startup with hyper growth potential, by far, 99% of the big companies are going to be built in Silicon Valley for the next five years. I'm not saying forever. In the next five to 10 years will still be the best place in the world. Why? There's more money there to build these kind of companies combined anywhere else in the world combined, right? Number one. Number two, there's more talent there to, that have built these kinds of companies that know how to do this. There's more growth hackers in that little area called Silicon Valley than any, anywhere else in the world combined. Um, and there's, there's more expert investors who have done this as an entrepreneur who are now investing on that side. So that's, that's consumer space. But I think that would hold true probably with enterprise as well. If you're talking about like hard tech, you know, and patent stuff, which we never care. I don't really care about patent stuff in my business. If a consumer startup is patenting something, they're doing something wrong. They should be focused on building their business. A patent is not going to save their life, right? Think about the reality is by the time they're done prosecuting the patent and suing Apple, they're out of business, right? That's not the kind of businesses we build. But for, for tech companies or biotech companies where patents are critical, okay, maybe you can make an argument that China is, is, has a lead now. And there's no doubt when you look at the demographics, you, you know, you, you, you can't be blind to the fact that the number of people and the sheer number of startups and the sheer amount of money is going to be leaning towards China at some point. And, and companies like Alibaba, where you have brilliant founders who are educated at Stanford Business School who go back and do it in China, it's just going to make that happen faster, right? And the stock market happening in China is going to increase that... But today, we're not close. We're still v really far ahead. Not only China, but Silicon Valley is orders of magnitude ahead of LA and New York and Toronto and even Startup Nation. But with that said, there's incredible stuff going on here. That's why I'm here, right? I think there's incredible talent in places like New York, LA, Toronto, and Startup Nation. Even so, here at Startup Nation, and, and that's why I want to reach out and say, if you've got a great consumer startup that is trying to achieve hyper growth, that needs the right kind of funding partner, or if you have friends who are doing this, contact us at Maven. You know, we might be the right fit. As a, just something popped up, up my mind. As a Jewish uh, Zionist, I, uh, I think you are, um, do you consider yourself as kind of uh, 
Israeli ambassador. Um, you know, I'm not, I, I'm not ashamed to be if I was, but I don't think I consider myself uh, publicly to be an Israeli ambassador, but probably if, you know, people look at the kind of companies I've invested in that have done well, and they see, oh, there's some kind of Israeli connection there, they may, you know, if, if they ever ask me about it, I would be happy to say, absolutely, I would love, I seek and would love to work with Israeli founders and CEOs. I will, I will say that there is sometimes a challenge with the benefit of having Startup Nation and the, you know, the training that you get in the military and the, you know, the, the responsibility and the sense that I could do anything, which is amazing for startups, can be a challenge for someone like me to help invest in your business because one of my filters is that you need to be coachable. It doesn't mean that you need to listen to everything I say, but there needs to be some kind of dialogue where it's not like, I'm right, you're wrong. And by the way, I'm not saying that you might be right and I might be wrong, and it, we just might not be the right fit. Right, so there's there's got to be a little bit of a of a balance with some of that, um, you know. But I'd be proud to be uh, an ambassador for Israeli startups in in Silicon Valley. That'd be a great thing. Okay, you are awarded as a startup <laughs> Brian <laughs> ambassador. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Our last question is the Peter Pan question: Is Jim, what are you going to do, or what would you like to do when you grow up? <laughs> you know, I've I've been very fortunate to uh, I've had what I call career ADD. I've done a TED talk. And I talk about this. If you haven't seen it, it's a short four-minute talk about finding your passion. And, you know, I think some people are really lucky. They find their passion right away, like from high school or college. And they just know, I'm going to do this. And they love doing it, and they're great at it, and they're very successful at it, whether that means they're published papers, they made a lot of money. Uh, that hasn't always worked for me. But I keep finding, uh, you know, from neuroscience to, you know, pre-med to baseball card shop to lawyer to, I actually, in between there, I didn't mention I was a, a um, regional director of a nonprofit. Uh, in, it, actually, I wanted to work for Israel, and the only nonprofit that had an opportunity for me to work for them is the New Israel Fund. I don't know if you know Hakeren Nechadash Al Israel. And I was, I'm really an APAC guy, too, so I'm kind of a, a right, lefty, centrist, a, you know, Israel supporter. So it was an amazing opportunity. I realized after three years, uh, nonprofit life really wasn't for me. Went back into high tech, loved doing the entrepreneurship. That was an amazing passion, uh, fulfilled. But I, as a family man with kids, I didn't know if I could do that for the rest of my life. And so I started angel investing. And what I think I've, I've realized is I found my passion. So I'm really good at mentoring. Whether it's coaching my kids' soccer team, which I love doing, winning championships and bringing together 12-year-olds or 15-year-olds or 8-year-olds, you know, like to, to achieve something, or bringing together a great team of tech founders to achieve some massive success. I don't have to be the front man. I love to see that and be a part of that. And doing that now as a professional investor, I think I found my passion. And I could see if I'm lucky enough to do this for the rest of my career, I would love to do this.